Hi everybody, welcome back to another episode of Tim Rambles On About Wines. Um, here we're going to talk about the uh, Stan Clark Bordeaux wines. Uh, we're going to go through ba basic chemistry and phenolics. So this is the first piece of the lecture um, and where we're going to talk about basic chemistry. So save uh, some of your wines uh, for the tasting component to go through to phenolics. So here is our estate vineyard and these are the wines we're going to be tasting today. Uh, let me show you the uh, order that we're going to be tasting them in. Uh, we're going to have Carmenere, Malbec, Cab Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Cabernet Sauvignon. So feel free to go ahead and pause the video for a second, get yourself all set up and ready to go. So again, stage one, basic wine chemistry. You guys know all about titratable acidity. So um, I thought this would be interesting. We did a little bit of breakdown. I didn't get lactic acid measured but we did get tartaric and we do have acetic. So um, I wanna talk about these acids and how you're gonna perceive them in the wine and realize that acid is an important piece because it, the higher the acid is, the more it tells you, uh, makes the, exacerbates the tannin or, or the opposite. You know, if you have lower acid, it'll make the wine feel a little uh, softer in your mouth. But the normal range in wine is somewhere between four and 15 grams a liter. Normal for red, somewhere between five and seven. Uh, rarely do you see them up in the eights, rarely do you see them down in the fours. So here's our titratable acidities in the glasses in front of you. And um, the Carmenere is actually fairly high, which is a, a, you know unusual for us. Usually the Carmenere is quite low, even if we add some. So this was pretty interesting about the 2018 vintages that we had uh, pretty good natural acidities. Um, the one thing you'll notice is they're not actually all that different. The only one that's uh, really markedly higher is the Cabernet Sauvignon. And it's interestingly not necessarily higher because of the, the, um, the fact that it's got more lactic or tartaric acid um, or any of the other ones that like succinic and things like that that come through fermentation. Um, this one's just a little bit higher because of something else. We'll talk about that when we get there. So we actually get tartaric acid measured and this was just for me something that blew my mind the first time this came across and then ETS tells me that they measure this every time they run a cam panel for us anyway so we might as well get the information. Because um, in the literature, it says the tartaric acid is the dominant acid in wine, and that is not necessarily true. Um, some of these wines had four or five, six grams of, of malic. And if they had five or six grams of malic uh, that converted, um, the dominant acid is going to be lactic. The Petit Verdot is a good example of that. That came in with about eight grams of, uh, of lactic in it. So that would mean that basically got cut in half. So four grams a liter of the acid in the Petit Verdot is lactic acid. Uh, so pretty interesting when you start talking about acid profiles um, that perhaps the dominant acid isn't tartaric. And, and I also want to point out that it isn't unusual for a red wine to have a volatile acidity that are you know approaching these numbers or above these numbers. Uh, the legal limit for volatile acidity is 1.4 grams a liter in a red wine. And it's really common to see them around, uh, you know, around anywhere in this range. So, you know, it is very reasonable in these really ripe reds that the dominant acid is going to be uh, acetic or lactic, uh, something that came from fermentation, uh, which is just really cool. Blew my mind. Think it's neat. I uh, hope you do too. All right, pH quick review. It's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. Actually, it's just reflection of the acid concentration of a wine, just backwards. The one thing I want to talk about is that pH and TA are not necessarily completely related. Um, they are close, and if you were to draw a trend line here, you'd absolutely see one, uh, that the, the higher the pH gets, the lower the acid generally is. But there's one data point that didn't even fit on this graph, and it's up above where the sign that says pH and TA are not directly related. And we had a wine that came in at a pH of 4, 5, uh, 9, but it had a uh, titratable city of 13 grams a liter. Um, and it was an ice wine that we picked, and it had so much potassium in it that it was buffering the heck out of it. So one of the things that we see in some of these wines with these really high, uh, you know, uh, you know, pHs and high TAs, which you see if you go make wine in hybrid areas, that's really common. Uh, that's really hard to get these these uh, numbers down. So for, for instance, this one outlier that you see at pH 3.8 and kind of cross line just above nine grams liter, that's also an ice wine. And, you know, you get a wine like that, getting that pH in line is really, really difficult. Um, sometimes you have to do some more aggressive acidification actions or ion exchange to get that pH down if you want to get it down without, you know, just adding acid and making the wine acerbic. But you can see that there's something along the lines causing some buffering here. So here's a good little reference for you guys to keep around. 
And these are our reference ranges for wines that we have uh, tested around here. Um, and Tempranillo, we see kind of all over the map. Uh, from Rioja, they tend to be quite low. Uh, and then, you know, in Walla Walla, they can be quite high. And then um, we see Syrah all over the map. And I think the reason we see Syrah all over the map is partially just sort of what we do with it here. Um, you know, Syrah in the old world generally are fairly low pH. And when I say old world, France. Um, and uh, they don't have that really high, uh, you know, high pH. And, and Australian Shirazes too was really remarkable to me when I was doing a Shiraz in Australia that they would have a pH of, you know, three, four, three, five, but, you know, and, you know, basically 27, 28 bricks. So pretty, pretty surprising. Um, and then notice fortified wines, the pH is a little bit lower. Um, and that's because they don't go through mallow. So fortified wines tend to have fairly low uh, pHs. Um, but just kind of all over the map, but uh, this is just a good, you know, book ends for you in your career to know how much, uh, you know, what's normal for a particular type of wine. So let's take a look at pH on our wines. And this is really interesting because you go back and uh, look at the, the uh, you know, TA and you notice the TA in the Cab Sauv is actually the highest, but it's tied for the Petit Verdot with the highest um pH. And um, we'll take a look at the potassium in a second. I think that's going to tell the story. Um, and and you look at these guys and the Carbonier at 385 is pretty normal. Malbec at 379, pretty normal. You know, for red wines in Washington, I see somewhere between 36 and 39 is kind of the standard for red wine. You know, probably 375, 38 is where the vast majority of reds land. Um, we are seeing the migration towards higher and higher pHs as the style of wine that people uh, are gravitating towards changes. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. So I want to get on about buffering. And buffering is the ability of a solution to resist a change in pH due to concentration of other ions like potassium. Um, in your blood, you have lots of ions. You know, potassium is one of them. You have calcium. Uh, you have sodium. And uh, those things... Uh, it, keep your blood from changing pH. And if your blood changes pH, you're in big trouble. You get real sick real fast. Um, so the thing is, is that in wine, our big dog in the room for buffering potential is, is the potassium level. And the more potassium that a wine has in it and can hold, um, the more it's going to buffer. So remember, we were talking about those high pHs in the Petit Verdot and Cab Sauv. You know, even though they had relatively high titratable acidities, um, bam, uh, there's quite a bit of potassium in these. And, and this is due to, you know, letting the, you know, grapes hang out for a little while, ripen a little bit. And, uh, that's causing that, that, that buffering in those, those wines. And you can see if you track the pHs along really well, you know, the Malbec at the lowest pH, you know, has one of the lower, uh, uh, uh potassiums. The Merlot is somewhere in between, and I think it's titratable city is a bit lower, so I think that's why that's falling in that way. But nonetheless, I think it was pretty neat to be able to take a look at the potassium in this and see that this is causing that buffering capacity. But it seems like most red wines, interestingly enough, hold around one gram a liter, somewhere in that range of tartaric acid, regardless of the potassium content. So what's really interesting is in some wines, we start seeing these two and 3,000, uh, not 3,000, but 23, 2,400 milligram a liter of potassiums. And uh, that gives this wine a real salinity, and they will be quite high in pH. Uh, but the, the, the potassium has a flavor. And so maybe as you're tasting through, you see if you can, can get some of that saltiness or salinity or that flavor that comes from actually tasting potassium. And if we were to think about this in a reasonable range, these are 1.3 to 1.5 grams per liter. So there's actually more potassium in all of these wines than there is tartaric acid. Cool. Ethanol uh, comes from the fermentative metabolism of glucose and fructose. Red wine, generally about 58% of the sugars converted to ethanol. You should know this by now. Uh, it's the number two dominant flavor behind acid. It gives the wine perception of body and heat. Without it, wine would be pretty boring and none of us would be here right now. So taking a look at our ethanols, uh, this is pretty surprising to me to see some of these alcohol contents. Um, and these are the, the bottles of wine that you actually have. These are really recent analyses. So there's some other data in there, but this is exactly what I pulled out of the barrel uh, and what's exactly in your bottle. So Carmenere, typically low. 13 is actually fairly high for our Carm. Uh, not unusual for our Carms to be, you know, barely on 12%. Um, and then uh, you can see those, the, the heat rising. Cab Franc being the highest, which isn't, again, unusual for us. Uh, by the time it gets flavor ripe, sugars uh, usually, uh, you know, kind of 
uh, pretty high. Uh, Merlot 14.5 is actually a little bit low uh, for us. I'm, normally, we're, our Merlot is kind of a little closer to 15%. Tiverno is always around 15 to 15.4. And uh, Cab Sauv is right smack on. So um, in terms of, of kind of standard bookends uh, for, you know, outside of the Carmenere, these are pretty right smack in the range of alcohol contents of, of Walla Walla Reds, uh, Bordeaux Reds. All right. VA. I'm going to talk about volatile acidity. I think this is really fun. This is a good lesson. We talked about this before, um, looking at the Cabernet Sauvignon. And so here we go. Uh, take a look at this. So there are some reasons that uh, VA comes. Hybrid fermentations, uh, just yeast will make it. Acetic acid bacteria make it. Um, they make it a crush and press, but primarily during aging is where we see that rise come from. So when we go into barrel, we're always going to see a little rise in VA. Um, also, acetic acid can come from just the wood itself, uh, just from sulfur gas in barrels, you can get a little bump. Um, and so that happens sometimes, and you might just get a little bit there. So it's, it's never any one particular thing that usually causes a major rise in VA. It's just managing all these little things along the line. Um, and of course, lactic acid bacteria, and then damaged berries can have some other things. Um, but the thing is, early on in a wine's life, you've got lots of acetic acid. And then eventually um, it converts and makes friends with uh, ethanol. So ethanol and acetic acid become ethyl acetate. It smells like fingernail polish remover or um, kind of ethereal or uh, like airplane glue. And you'll find that wines that have a little higher VA when they're young don't necessarily taste that way. But as they're in bottle for a longer time, they start to get that higher tone uh, aromatic uh, compounds to them. So you'll note that when you pick out an older bottle of wine, all of a sudden you have one you've aged for a while and you open it and you pour it in a glass and you're like, whoa, um, that's really potent. And so at the end of the day, a VA is, it's not the compound that makes the poison, it's the dosage. So a little bit of VA is good, a little bit too much can make the wine be unpalatable. So it's just all about management. So you don't really want them too low and you don't want to get them too high. So let's take a look at the, the numbers here. And here we go. I think this is a really cool story and it tells the story just like we talked about the cab last week, uh, how we had that sort of stuck ferment. And again, this is not a high number. This is what I would call a very average number. Uh, we just happen to make really low VA wines at, at college sellers for, for whatever reason. I think it's just general management, feeding and taking care of things and staying on top of it. But um, the, the all, all the reds in, in 2018 were remarkably low. And, uh, you know, coming into bottle with 15% alcohol wines that are under a half a gram, around a half a gram a liter of bottle acidity is, is remarkable. I've never seen anything like it in my career, to be dead honest with you. Um, and so uh, the, the Cab Sob is probably the only one that's kind of normal. Strangely enough, it looks like the outlier, but it's, it's actually kind of the normal, uh, would be more the standard. Um, and, and that was just because of that stuck ferment that, uh, you know, got raped, not stuck. I shouldn't say it was not a stuck ferment. It, the ferment got outrun by the mallow. So um, nonetheless, I think it's probably great. It's probably in balance um, and it'll age out and uh, bring in some higher tone uh, notes to the wine when it gets a little older. All right. <clears throat> and then free SO2, I'm not going to get into all the molecular and all that other stuff because I don't think it's terribly important right now. But I think that uh, I think you guys are there with that. But what I do want to note is that when we get into phenolics, this is going to change the way that the wine is perceived. So um, our uh, free SO2s are all sitting on around 20. I think they're higher than that. Um, you know, Leonard and I had to go through and do an add kind of at the last minute. And when you add and don't stir the barrels, it tends to sink. So um, I bet you we've got a little bit more in it than that. The only reason why the cab is so high is I, I took six gallons of it before I uh, uh, sent it into the samples and um, pulled it from the middle of a barrel. So I think that's why the cab's showing a little bit higher. Um, and when I pulled that wine, uh, I brought it home because that's what I'm going to do for the finding trials for next week. So I think it's probably from the middle of the barrel where these other ones are a little bit more from the top. So I think that's why you're seeing that a uh, little bit lower number, but that will impact what we see. In any case, if these were, were wines and we got this sample number without a stir, we would definitely be going in and adding. I, I like to keep our reds somewhere around 30 to 35 parts free. Um, and we have a cool cellar. So that's kind of how we maintain the, the microbiological background of the wine. All right, <clears throat> basic chemistry overview. Uh, in terms of acidity, these wines aren't too different. The titrated velocity in the cab sob is higher because of the acetic acid. So oh, that's really cool. Um, but it doesn't uh, really affect pH because acetic acid is such a weak acid. So you get this 
situation where you've got a fairly, you know, a little bit higher TA, but your pH doesn't move. And that's useful. Say you don't have a VA still, say you don't have any tools or toys or anything. If all of a sudden your pH stays the same, and it's always 395, 395, 395, but your TA starts creeping up from, you know, 5.7 to 5.8 to 5.9, as your titratable acidity is going up, the reason it's going up is because of acetic acid. So you don't necessarily have to measure, you know, if you don't have fancy tools, you don't have a fancy lab, you know, if you track simply your TAs in barrel and you see that number start creeping up, you you know the reason it's creeping up is because of all acidity. So anyway, basic chemistry tells one story, but I say let's take a deeper look and go check out some phenolics. See you in a minute.